Good evening. Okay, that is on for sure. Uh, welcome. My name is Victoria De Francisco Soto. I am the very proud dean of the Clinton School. And 
I can't tell you how excited I am about tonight's program for many reasons. Uh, the, the topic of Hispanics and Latino growth nationwide, and especially here in Arkansas, this is our inaugural Clinton Presidential Center Presents program. Uh, the guests we have tonight are nationally known for their voice and for their advocacy and just tremendous women. Uh, a, little, a little bit of background, a little factoid on Hispanic Heritage Month. It was a presidential proclamation. I have it here, 3869, signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1968. Originally, Hispanic Heritage Month was a week, and then Reagan later expanded it to a whole month. And, and I think it's, it's so interesting to think about the time when Hispanic Heritage Month started, which was a time when less than 5% of the population in this country was Hispanic or Latino or Latinx, I use them interchangeably. Today, Latinos are over 20% of the population in the country. And they're everywhere, right? It used to be just in Texas in that Southwest region, smattering in Florida and North and the Northeast, but today everywhere. And, and being a, a Latina from the borderlands and having lived in Texas for a long time, I didn't know what I was gonna find in Arkansas. But what I've come to find is a vibrant and growing Latino population, which is really the model of what we're seeing nationwide. And I think it's it's so special to be able to commemorate this growth and this dynamism. And you know, in, in thinking about bringing Daniela here, if there's one aspect that personifies Latinos, it's our youth, not my youth in particular, but the youth of the millennials and the Gen Zers under 18. And so in looking at this demographic and understanding their path and their struggles and how they are forming their own leadership paths. They are our future, they are our future workforce, our future leaders. I am so excited about digging into this topic of carving out spaces for young people, young people of color and especially women of color. And with us here tonight to have that conversation are two incredible women uh, in conversation with Daniela's most recent book, The Other, How to Own Your Power at Work as a Woman of Color. And having read this book, I can tell you that I really can't think of a better way to dig in to Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and we have uh, copies on sale, so be sure to get one if you haven't already picked up Daniela's book. And I'm not going to go into long bios because both of our speakers today have very long and impressive bios. But just quickly, Daniela Pierre Bravo is a best-selling author, public speaker, MSNBC reporter, in addition to her uh, authorship of The Other. Danielle Musselman has an extensive background in sports broadcasting with years of experience in anchoring, hosting, reporting for ESPN, ESPN News, and Fox Sports. Uh, Danielle is also very active in philanthropy here in the state of Arkansas. She's co-chair of Coaches versus Cancer Wives and Friends, uh, serves as the market chair for Make-A-Wish Foundation here in Mid-South Region, and she is married to someone some of you might know, uh, the current Arkansas men's basketball coach, Eric Musselman. So with that, let me welcome Daniela and Danielle to the stage. Thank you. Um, it is, we are so excited to be here, first of all, I want to say that, and it's amazing to see you guys out there. Um, I'm going to start out with a question for both of us, um, but you get to go first. Okay. What does public service mean to you? I mean, what a great place to talk about that. Um, I mean, public service for me is, is really just being in service of others. And I think you can do that in different ways. For me, it's storytelling. Um, you know, I grew up in a small town where I didn't see a lot of the stories and the people like me reflected. And for me, what I do right now, I see as service just reflecting people's identities onto themselves and the potential of themselves. And that's in short what public service means to yeah. me. I think for me, public service is kind of changed meanings. And I, I know for me right now, um, it means directly helping others. I'm really involved in the nonprofit sector and I love that. But it's 
when you think about that, it's something that people are sometimes like, what could I do? I can't help anyone. And right. I say everyone needs help in some way and everyone can give help in some way. And yeah. um, so I just. Um, and what a great place to have this conversation absolutely. about public service and, and this conversation. So thank you so much, Vicki, for, for having us. So I don't mean to brag, but I have, I got an early copy of the other. So, <laughs> um, so I know a lot about your background and what growing up was like for you, but I want you to just kind of share a little bit about that for everyone. So I'm originally from Santiago, Chile. I uh, grew up in a small town in Ohio called Lima. I don't know if anybody here knows. No? Okay. <laughs> it's a small town in Ohio. And I found out from an early age that I was undocumented and there weren't a lot of um, conversations in my family about what that would mean. And it wasn't until I started applying to colleges and figuring out that I couldn't uh, apply to any government loans or government scholarships where I realized that uh, doors were quick, quickly closing out on me. And I, and I thought I was the only one. You know, this is back in 2009. So the word undocumented was just a filthy word back in, in my hometown. And there weren't a lot of welcoming remarks to immigrants back then. And I, for a long time, I thought I was the only. And I would, I remember going into um, like these corners of the internet, looking at bulletin boards of people who had my similar experience. But it wasn't until DACA came out in 2012 where I realized that I wasn't the only, there was almost a million of us in this country. And slowly, little by little, we started coming out of the shadows. And um, that's when I realized that I could have not only an ID, but an identity and a sense of belonging in, in a place where, you know, all of the messages growing up told me that I didn't belong and that I shouldn't be here. And that, you know, caused a lot of shame, which I talk about in the book. You, yeah, you talk about that. And I'm sure a lot of that led to kind of downplaying that background. Mm, and yeah. I, that's something really that I feel like I can relate to. What would you tell young people of color today about really embracing their heritage? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because even when I was writing this book, you know, I had written a book with Mika Brzezinski back in 2019 about young women knowing and growing their value. And we talked to incredible people for that book, um, CEOs of different companies, women and men. And, you know, I, I felt confident in what I had built in, in my small, you know, the, the small length of the career that I had in that point. But it wasn't until I read this or I started writing this book that I realized that I had been hiding a lot of shame and in, internalization about ickiness about who I was and my identity and even my, you know, my undocumented status. Um, and it came up in, in small ways. Like at the beginning of my career, um, I was a booking producer uh, for this morning show. And every time immigration would come up or DACA, where I knew that I was very acutely aware of that subject more than anybody else in the room, it was hard for me to raise my hand and say, that's the story that we should be covering. Or we need to get this person on to talk about this because it's important. And it took me a while um, to get to a point where I could fully find my voice and use my seat at the table because of that same reason, because I hadn't fully reckoned with the parts of my identity that I had fragmented in order to find psychological belonging. Is that what really inspired you to write this book? Yeah, I think... At the core of it, if it's one emotion, it's to have people feel less lonely because I was very lonely in, in, my own, in my own life growing up because when you're in the shadows and when you're constantly trying to go under the radar and finding rules of belonging and you don't have that support system to understand what it feels like to be the other, again, you think you're the problem and you slowly start to condition to quiet your voice. And you know the title of the book is The Other, which by the way, I hate because nobody wants to be I like, the other. I like it though. But I ended up keeping it because I think it was Tori Morrison who, um, Tony Morrison who said this, but the other is just basically seeing yourself through the eyes of somebody else, right? And we have found success and safety in doing that. 
but it's also as we get further along in our lives and our career, we realize that we have muted and silenced ourselves um, in order to find that belonging. And what I really wanted the readers to come out to come out from the book with is an understanding of not just who we are, but ultimately seeing ourselves through our own eyes. And that sounds simple, but it's really not. Because once you have identified yourself through expectations and um, what other people expect you to be, right? How to not create dissonance with your own sense of identity, right? That idea of not making people feel uncomfortable with your presence. Um, that's hard and it's, not, it's counterintuitive to do otherwise. There's a word that you use in the book, otherness, hmm. which I love. Explain to our audience what that means. It's that feeling of, of having, you know, to be labeled the other and actually buying into that narrative, right? We all have those um, experiences early on where we've said something that made people feel uncomfortable um, because of who we are. Or I talked to, for example, um, this, this black woman who, who um, shared an anecdote with me where she just, the way, the way that she had her hair at work was such an impediment for her to bring ideas and be creative into the workplace because innately she felt like she couldn't be who she was. And that does a lot to our psyche. And so that otherness not only just makes us feel lonely, but it, it self alienates ourselves um, to the point where we're not able to do the job that we need to do because we are so consciously aware of our otherness and are so consciously aware and trying to find ways to um, diminish that otherness, to not cause dissonance. And it takes up a lot of emotional energy. And I talk to a lot of women in the book who go through that burnout. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it, it keeps you from being on an equal playing field. Yeah. And, and you talked a little bit about the road to that equal playing field basically being like an uphill battle. Why, why do you think that? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, growing up, I, I, I grew up undocumented, so my barriers were pretty clear cut. Um, and uh, going into college, I, we didn't really know how I was going to uh, finish each semester because, A, we didn't have money to finish paying for college. I went to Miami University, which is a pretty hefty uh, yearly fee, but I got a small scholarship, a $2,500 scholarship, and that was like my, my hope to keep me going. But um, I took semesters off here and there, and it wasn't until uh, the, my last year of college that um, I ended up applying to everywhere in New York City because I thought, well, if I'm going to try to make it into the media world, it's going to be in New York City where I can just kind of blend in with other people who are diverse because at the time I was still in Ohio. So I ended up, I'll just tell, tell this anecdote quickly because you talk about how, how I dealt with my otherness. Um, I applied to everywhere and anywhere in, in New York and I, I get a call back from um, Sean Combs's company, P. Diddy. And he has this marketing agency that a lot of people don't know about because people usually know him through um, Bad Boy Entertainment or Sean Combs, um, Sean John, the, the clothing line. And uh, I, I did a little white lie on my resume and I said that I lived in New York City instead of Ohio because I didn't want people to have some sort of reaction to me being in Ohio or not being local or being a college student that wouldn't be able to afford this unpaid internship because I was used to people making excuses about me or have these preconceived notions about me um, because I was an immigrant or, or whatnot. So I had been conditioned to, you know, preempt those things. And lying about my address was one of one of the ways that I that I got um, that 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 I kind of put myself in an equal playing field. And um, so they call me up and they, they go, can you come in for an interview tomorrow? <laughs> and I go, yeah, I can come in tomorrow. And you were in Ohio. I was in the cornfields of Ohio, like, <laughs> like in Oxford, Ohio. I was studying for my, like an econ or, or some exam or something. We were about to uh, go into the summer. And um, I say, yes, of course, I hang up. I immediately panic, right? So when you're undocumented, you don't have a driver's license. You don't have an ID. I couldn't get on a plane. I couldn't get on a, you know, in a, a car and, and just drive over. 
So I'm like, okay, how, how am I gonna do it? A bus, okay, a bus, Greyhound. So I get on the Greyhound bus website. I'm like starting to, to see like what the next bus out was. It was like in three hours. I paid one of my only friends who had a car to drive me to Cincinnati, Ohio. And I get on this bus and I, I didn't know, like I just, one thing at a time, one thing at a time. So I got on this bus, it ended up being 18 hours, nine really sketchy stops along the way. I get to Port Authority, I clean up, I wash, I change, and I run into this internship interview um, a few blocks down from Times Square. And uh, <laughs> the person that was interviewing me said, because I confessed, you know, I, I didn't just hop off a subway. I actually came from Ohio. And she looked at me like I was totally crazy. And she goes, you know, we could have done this over Skype. <laughs> And I, but I, I just said, you know, I wanted you to know how hungry I was for this opportunity. And she goes, you know, it's unpaid. I go, I know, I know. So they were like, okay. So they gave me the internship that summer. And it was just, again, I was so undocumented. So I didn't know if I had spent all this money, I was still paying for college, like what this would amount to. You know, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I ended up getting another unpaid internship at MTV Networks in their ad sales department. And I just like tried to find whatever I could do to get cash paying jobs. I would go up and down restaurant row with my resume, just like asking for the manager, seeing who would hire me, um, babysitting. I was pet sitting, uh, dog walking, which did you know that in New York, you get pretty good money to walk dogs. I can imagine. Yeah. I was doing that during my lunch breaks um, and just really doing anything that I could. And it wasn't until that summer that, oh, I get so emotional thinking about it, but DACA came out. But um, how I dealt with my otherness was not believing that I was the other and not believing that I didn't have a chance at an equal playing field, even if I had to kind of make my own rules along the way. Because I realized that if I didn't believe in myself and if I didn't give people kind of a, an expectation on how to see me or a precedent on how to see me, then nobody was going to see me that way if I didn't set the bar. And that was kind of my way of, of setting the bar for myself through that really crazy summer. <laughs> when you are the other or the only, it can really kind of affect your personality in yeah. the work space. How did that present itself for you? In a lot of different ways. I mean, I think I found success in many ways by being what other people wanted me to be. And at the beginning, you know, it really paid off. I was the go-getting immigrant. I said yes to everything. I, you know, I, I got coffees like really well. Like I talk about that in my book in 2019 with Mika. One of the reasons why she was able to trust me was because I got her Black Eyed Mistro extra hot, extra foam. Like my life depended on it. And it sounds so silly, but that was my way of like building value early on. And I was really good at that. But one of the things that I talk about in the book and it's not just my experience, but the experience of many other women of color is as we move along and we take up more space, we have to um, go by different rules. And it's not the same rules that got us in the door, which by the way, I would never discourage anybody coming in to put their head down, do the work and work the extra hours and say yes to everything. You absolutely, absolutely should do that. Um, especially, you know, in our fields, like you have to be that person to set yourself apart in year two, three, four. But as you move along, you have to operate a different way. And it's very counterintuitive to our lived experiences as the other, because we have grown up generationally through struggle. We've grown up generationally being eternally grateful for the, all the opportunities that we've been given as others, right? Because even in my own family, <clears throat> there was this nuanced sense of us not being on the equal playing field of everyone else. And it was subconsciously kind of um, told, was told to me through my grandma and my mom because they felt that way. And it was something that just kind of generationally it was passed down. has passed down. My favorite chapter is when you talked about duality being a superpower. Mm -hmm. I, I highlighted it. Um, explain what that means. I, I think that it's it's so important and it's something that you kind of have to grow into understanding. Yeah. Well, in short, it's being two things at once. And a lot of us have to feel the pressure to choose one thing or another. For me, it was, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm too Latina and then being, you know, not American enough. And I always felt like I needed to choose between that duality. Between, in essence, I actually 
gave more richness into the spaces that I was in um, by being both things and by embracing both things. And I think I, I lost a lot of myself starting from losing my accent because I felt like I had to assimilate to the point of losing parts of my identity. So I really didn't reckon with this sense of duality until, you know, just recently, because it is it is a superpower and it and it does bring something to the table where other people can't bring the same thing. And um, W.E. Du Bois, I, I talk about him in the book, talks this, about this thing called double consciousness. Um, and uh, it's this idea where we can see the world differently through our, our duality, right? Um, through our two identities. But in a way, it gives us an awareness and an understanding of people, what people want from us. And in a different way, it, it mutes us because we're so hyper aware of how people see us and our duality that again, we feel like we need to choose because it goes back to that thing we said about dissonance. You know, it's, we don't wanna cause dissonance because as people who have grown up as the other, we have felt the repercussions of making people feel uncomfortable through our, pre through our presence, through bias, through prejudice, through not being an equal playing field. And so that is something that it, it's so important because our duality is, is what enriches the spaces that we work in. But was it like a light bulb moment where you said, hey, this is a positive thing or did it really just take time? I think it started when I, I wrote the book with Mika and she really pushed me to talk about my story. And I always felt so uncomfortable doing it. Like even now, even when I talk about some of the anecdotes in the book about my personal experience, it feels so weird. But part of that was an exercise of just embracing where I came from and embracing my roots and understanding that there's, there was richness in my own identity as a Latina and, and uh, my immigrant roots and my struggles. I think that oftentimes um, in my career, I felt, you know, that I needed to be something I wasn't. You know, I I came into my job in a pretty intimidating space. It was very male dominated. Um, I was at I was um, you know in editorial rooms with people who had gone to Ivy League, uh, were Ivy League educated, and it always felt weird about talking about my background or even this is hard to say, but standing up for stories that were part of my background because it felt personal, which, and, and, and the reason why it felt personal was because I hadn't reckoned with my identity, those layers of shame that I was holding on to. And it wasn't until in 2019 where I had no choice but to talk about my story and to talk about my, my experience being undocumented. And it was really Mika who helped me embrace that because she was kind of like, okay, we're writing a book and you're going to talk about your story and kind of threw me into the fire, but in a good way, yeah. because I found so much richness because at the end of the day, going back to public service, I realized it had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with my story because I don't, <laughs> my story is not unique at all, but it is the story of many other women and men who have had that same struggle. And I realize now that my duality and it, I needed to go in, I needed to kind of lean into that because at the end of the day, it meant that other people were included at the table. It meant that other people were reflected in my story. And so when I realized that I needed to get over the fact that it wasn't about me, that I really became more comfortable expressing and leaning into that duality. You talked about rules being rewritten as you moved up the ladder. Mm -hmm. Explain what that means. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, um, and a lot of the women that I spoke to for the book uh, who from, were from different backgrounds with the idea that I had to put my head down, do the work, and that someone will notice. You and I know that in corporate America, nobody's going to notice <laughs> if you're not telling people what you're doing, right? And going back to that idea of being overly grateful for everything, being grateful is such a beautiful virtue, right? I'm not saying that being grateful is not a good thing, but when you feel like your opportunities are based on somebody else's good graces, and you feel like you're, if you ask for more, that you're gonna be seen as ungrateful, that's when those rules start working against you. And it's it's going back to, you know, what, what the first book that I wrote is understanding innately what your value is. Because when you feel like 
all of these opportunities are predicated on somebody else and that your value is only incumbent on as much access as somebody else gives you, then we're reverting to the way that we have always seen ourselves as the other, which is trying to find these clues of inclusion. But as we move along in our careers, we have to rewrite those rules, right? And we have to take up more space and lean into that duality because at the end of the day, that's, that's what's gonna get us to where we wanna go professionally. Talking about value, men in this country out-earn women, and when it comes to women of color, the gap is even wider. What needs to happen in order for that to change? I mean, a lot of things. I think- Where do um, we begin? I mean, <laughs> systemically and in, in, from an institutional point, point, there's so much, right? And a lot of it is, is based on unconscious bias and, and the way we give out promotions and, and, and decision-making and salary transparency, which is huge. So, right, that's a whole different bucket, um, of which I really struggled with in the book on whether or not to go at length with, because that is a book in itself. Um, but the, the part of the book that I talk about, which is really just focused on the part that you can control, which, um, you know, you talk about the, the pay gap. Um, this year, white women um, are slightly better off than last year, but black women and Latina women have actually fallen behind. Latinas have always been um, at, the, at the tail end of equal pay. Um, and last year, I think we were at 53 cents per every dollar a white non-Hispanic man makes. And I, that statistics is in my book. But this year, my book is actually outdated now because this year, Latinas make 49 cents to a, a, a white uh, non-Hispanic men's dollar. So we've actually fallen behind even further. So a lot of it is systemic in nature. But the part that I talk about in the book is, again, the part that you can control. And especially in this remote work that we live in, it's not just OK to talk about our wins and to keep your boss updated and all of like the, the, the practical stuff that I talk about in the book, but it's so necessary. Right. And things like asking for more and not, you know, and and going into the negotiating table and learning how to, uh, you know, uh, push back when somebody says no. Those are all important things. And so a lot of the part of the book talks about um, negotiating and advocating for ourselves because it's such an important part of not only just the the salary that we make yearly, but generationally. Right. What what. Um, what is part of our um, lived experience. And also the equal pay, every time we go into negotiate and when we decide not to ask for more, we're adding to that statistic. So it's, it's really important. But I think, you know, the, the generation after me is so much better at this than, than our generation because they've seen the inequities. They've seen- um, And they're talking about it. And they're talking this. about it. And, and, and we're not afraid now to do it. You know, I opened up this mentorship program called Accesso where we talk about, we have these intimate conversations with um, small groups of, of women who are going through the same career pain point. And we talk about things like salary transparency or how to deal with toxic environments or how to push back because if you're expecting to talk about what you've brought to the table at the negotiating table, it's already too late. So all of these things need to happen before we get into the negotiating table. We are so thankful that you wrote this book. And I just wonder what words of encouragement, you talk about the next generation, what, what words would you say to them? Yeah. <laughs> where, I don't I mean, even know where you begin. Yeah, I, I think, again, I think this generation is so savvy on, on things that our generation um, hadn't really understood, but I think, one of the things is to, to harness all of this knowledge and power and use it. Um, a lot of uh, what has um, been available to me these last couple of years through writing this for the first book and then this book is having the opportunity to talk about, to talk to women, um, women of color or women who have been undocumented or other uh, DOC recipients who are so smart. And I actually don't think that Gen Z has a problem with confidence because this generation has a lot of firsts. 
It has a lot of women who were the first of their families to get into college. A lot of women who were the first um, Latinas or uh, the black women uh, in, in their career spaces. But what I think, um, what, what I would want to know if I was them is that your otherness is not something that should be hidden, um, but that it's actually something that enriches the spaces and the places that you inhabit. And I think leaning into that is super important. I love that. I think I wish that I had heard that when I was first starting out. You feel less lonely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have a few rapid fire questions for you because we want to know about you. Um, and then we'll get into some audience submitted questions, if that's fine. Um, I want to know who inspires you. Oh, wow. I think, I mean, there's so many, there's so many women that inspires me. Um, my mom, my grandma, like they're, they're such, I, I know we all probably have um, stories of uh, how hardworking um, our immigrant families are. I mean, and it's hard to talk about this because my mom and I <laughs> were very different and we don't see the eye on a lot of different things. But um, that sense of family and that sense of being there when the going gets tough is always there. And I just want to share this. This uh, You said rapid, rapid <laughs> question, sorry. Um, you my tell mom and my story. grandma. You tell your story. Yeah. Um, this, this encapsulates perfectly the, the, the relationship with me and my mom. Um, when I was going into college, I finished my first year of college. And, um, again, I was, you know, I didn't know how I was going to graduate cause we were, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have any money. <laughs> I was just kind of figuring out, um, odd job after odd job on how to pay for it. And I remember the summer before my sophomore year, I was, um, I had like three jobs. I was working um, two restaurant jobs in Mary Kay. Does anybody here know what Mary Kay is? Yes. Yeah. Great mascara. So yes. Um, so I was a senior sales consultant in Ohio, and I was training these women around around the state. And uh, I remember I was out on my delivery, and I was like on the third shift, and it was like three weeks before I got back to school, and I really didn't have as much money as I, as I needed for that first semester, but I had like almost enough. So these last three weeks were really going to make a difference on whether I could go back to school. And I remember doing a delivery, um, driving a car, uh, which I shouldn't have been driving because I didn't have an, I didn't have a driver's license. I was, I was undocumented, but it was um, in the neighborhood and I wanted to seem professional. And so I was going to do a, a Mary Kay party and I was on my way to drop off products. And I was answering the phone and from a, from a client and I was hanging up and I'm, I'm trying to park in somebody's driveway and I fender bended a parked car in front of me. And this car was a really old beat up car. And if it would have been another car, it wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been damage, but I ended up hitting and I, I don't know much about cars, but like a really expensive part of the back end of the car. And I was in no position to argue with the, the owner. So I just said, named your price. And she, she named her price and it was all of the money. It was thousands without like, I think the $3,000 that I had to go back to school. And uh, for someone in my position where, you know, I had such little hope on how things were going to go, that completely destroyed me. Um, and I remember my mom picking me up and we pulled into a raised parking lot and we felt like I, I felt so defeated. And if anybody here know has a Latina mom or even just, you know, your mom, she's always going to find a way. And especially my mom, she always says, you know, we're going to find a way out of this. And that moment in that parking lot, I, I'll never forget this. It was the middle of the night. And she was speechless because neither of us knew what was going to happen after this. And I remember hugging her and just crying. And I had never seen my mom cry ever because she never showed emotion. And, oh, it makes me tear up. She kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because she felt in that moment so much guilt over the, the situation that she had put me in because she wanted to give me a better life, but she, in that moment, we felt the repercussions of everything I had worked so hard for and there not being a way out of it. And that was a really vulnerable moment. Um, 
but that's that's the sort of relationship that I have with my mom and and I just wanted to share that because at the end of the day, you know, she's what got me through it and I remember her and my entire family working at movie theaters at night just to send me money uh, for college little by little. So when you talk about the responsibility that I have on my shoulders to and other responsibility of other immigrants and first gens to make our sacrifices of our parents worth it. It's that it's of that because of that story right there. Yeah, no, she's so proud of you. No, I mean, I can't you. even imagine. Um, all right, the rest will be rapid fire. Rapid fire. <laughs> okay. Unless you have a good story. <laughs> uh, Netflix and chill or club hop? Netflix and chill. <laughs> Who is your dream interview guest? Ooh, Oprah. Same. Of course. Same. Like, of course. I am most proud of blank. Hmm. Um, I'm most proud of having other women be reflected in my story and, and seeing aha moments for them through, through reading my book. If you had one do-over in life, what would you use it on? I, this is cliche, but I don't, I don't do do-overs. I think um, everything it happens for a reason. Not um, even the fender bender? <laughs> you know what's crazy? Okay, I have to say this. You know what's crazy? So the fender bender, yeah, horrible experience. It actually put me a semester behind. So I actually, I went into college with a full year off of my belt because I did college courses in high school and I, um, I did college credit. So I knocked off a full year. The fender bender gave me one semester. So it added one semester to my, to my belt. The summer in New York wouldn't have happened if I had graduated that May. I love that. I love that. God, I mean, I'm a, I'm a woman of faith, so, so I, everything happens Everything for a does happen yeah. for a reason. Um, dream job, not counting your current jobs. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know, like uh, having a co-hosting gig with Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you involving You said dream Oprah. job, yeah. <laughs> um, and what's next for you? Um, I, I, you know, doing the day job, <laughs> um, we're in a really interesting position right now, um, going into, uh, an election, uh, election period. And I'm just excited to go around the country, talking to people, telling the stories that, um, haven't been told as much. I was just in Mississippi. Um, and I'm so proud of the story that we did on the water crisis there and the racial cost of, of, of Jackson. Um, I was just in the Rio Grande Valley talking to Latino voters and the switch to uh, the Republican uh, side that they're doing down there. And I, I just am excited to just travel more the country and just tell stories of underrepresented communities because um, that's something that I, I, I really hold dear to my heart. And I think it's my why. I think it's, I think it's my why. All right, we'll jump into some audience submitted questions. First, we have, there's no names associated, but if you want to raise your hand, you just go for it. Um, how, as a woman of color, can I advocate for myself in a world slash system that negates my ability, educational background, and experience simply because of my color? Yeah, that's a loaded question, and that's, that's what the whole book is about. But I think that there are, are ways to um, push back um, in real time that I think is really effective. Because every time, and this is what I learned, every time we, we confirm somebody's bias, we are reaffirming it. So if I am always the yes girl and the eternally grateful immigrant, if I don't deviate from that and start to say no to things that no longer give me value back and start to delegate and start to act with more power, I am going to be reaffirming the stereotypes people have of that particular person. So I think that's really important. And I just want to say a tip on microaggressions that I thought, I thought was really important that I have in the book. And I remember this, this Asian woman that I talked to in the book, her, um, this was a, a hard thing for her to internalize because her boss, who was pretty much her mentor, said a comment in the office one time where she called her a beautiful China doll. And to her, that hurt. And it was a clear microaggression. And um, it meant that every time she was in a room where she had to creatively brainstorm or 
talk about her ideas, it was harder for her to do that because she felt like she was the other. And it, it pierced that idea of, of being the other. And um, one of the ways to do that, to, to combat that in real time, is to clarify what that person meant. Because oftentimes we either laugh at that what that person says to again not cause dissonance because we don't want to make that person feel uncomfortable with their comment, stunned. or you're awesome. stunned and you don't say anything. So asking them for clarification, I think, is really important, and it's not combative, right? So you could say, "What did you mean by that?" Right? Because it does two things. One, it gives them the the chance to clarify what they meant because people some sometimes say ignorant things and they don't hear themselves. Right, so it allows them to um, clarify what they meant or apologize, and that gets it off your shoulders. Because what happens when you don't get that apology? You feel like it's your fault. You feel like you're the problem. You feel like you're crazy. Did I look into that too much? Am I overthinking it? Am I being hysterical? Am I being crazy? Right. So that that helps with that. Or they double down on the comment and say, "Yeah, that's what I meant." Now you have data to go to HR, and you know. To, to, to use those instances as as racism, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but the question is, who is your greatest cheerleader in your career and what did it mean to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's been, now as the years has passed on, I've had so many different women who have advocated for me um, in different rooms, but Mika Brzezinski is, is one of those people. I mean, she not only just gave me a platform, but she has mentored me and has sponsored me and is really the model of what women and men need to do to promote and elevate and give equity to not just women of color, but women who need it, which is, you know, she's spoken about me um, in so many rooms that I didn't have access to. Um, so it would definitely be Mika. How did your vision of success balance with your work and your personal life? It didn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think I, I definitely reached a, a point of burnout. Um, and I talk about it in the book. I think a lot of us realized that during the pandemic. Um, survival mode is something that is really intrinsically familiar to us because we've seen generational struggles. We've seen women um, in our in our lives who who have use their productivity as a way to find success. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen my mother, you know, wince in pain because her arthritis is flaring up and she had to do like waitressing jobs after her factory jobs. Like that's just a way of being. And I think for me, it was harder to discern when I didn't need to do those things anymore. I didn't need to have, be in that hamster wheel of like saying yes to everything because it always leads to burnout. So I think for me, things that have helped is delegating more, saying no to the things that no longer give me value back in my career, which is really hard. Yeah, and um, just prioritizing personal life a little bit more, which is, again, really hard to do. I think all women can relate to those yeah. things, for sure. Did you ever have a moment when you felt, I don't have to prove my worth because I am worthy? Yeah, and I have to remind myself about that because as a DACA recipient, I mean, the DACA program has been in place for about 10 years. And if you have seen the news, every time it goes up, what happens? There's so many op-eds of DACA recipients or activists who are proving the worth of DACA recipients or proving the belonging of DACA recipients in, in this country. Oh, that they're police surprise uh, writers or they're doctors or they're changing the world. And it's like, we have to prove ourselves. It's like, not enough. We have to constantly be proving ourselves. And I think that has had, had a real repercussion on a conscious and a subconscious level of, for me in my career, because I've always had that kind of, you know, um, hanging over my head. That if I didn't work hard enough, that I didn't say, if I didn't say yes enough, if I didn't do enough, then I wouldn't be enough. So for a long time, my productivity you know, I, I base my, my worth on my productivity. Um, and, and the way that, I, that I, um, I learned not to do that or to remind myself that I didn't have to do that is to give space for the soft skills that we bring, right? So our lived experiences. Um, if you work for any corporation, any institution, any nonprofit, whatever it is, where the client base is... Uh, US customers, your experience is valuable because 
by and large, the U.S. is becoming a more diverse place. And the more voices that we have of diversity in the room and the more we use that is actually of benefit to the product or the service or the bottom line of the company. So once I realized that, that my voice and my presence and my lived experience and my background was important to the news institution that I work at, that's when I started getting, feeling more empowered, right? Because it wasn't just my productivity that was important, but it was me, it was my lived experience, it was all those things that gave richness to the places of work that I belonged in. You are such an inspiration. Can we give her a round of applause? First time in Arkansas, thank you so much thank for joining so us. Much. We are so excited to be here, and um, this was just amazing. Thank you, and thank you so much for coming. And are you, sign do you, are you signing copies of the book tonight? At Am I? Yes. <laughs> Did I just volunteer yeah. you to sign <laughs> copies of the book? <laughs> I'd love to, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it is, uh, of course, always rewarding to be a participant in a great conversation, but it's a lot of fun and really satisfying to watch a great conversation. And thank you, uh, Danielle, up, up here, Bravo, and, and thank, thank you, so Danielle much. Musselman, for giving us the treat of watching a great conversation tonight. Thank you all so much. Again, thank you. Let's thank these, these wonderful folks. Oh, I need to turn the mic on. I don't know why I'm doing um, I'm Jay Barth. I'm the director of the Clinton Presidential Library. and. As uh, Dean Soto said, uh, this is the inaugural Clinton Center, Clinton Presidential Center Presents uh, event. Uh, and it is a place uh, where, in, and we do this a lot, where three institutions that have uh, shared, um, shared missions but interlocking missions uh, come together. And that's, of course, the Clinton School of Public Service, the Clinton Presidential Library, and the Clinton Foundation. And so we will be doing this more. Uh, and indeed, the next event in the Clinton Presidential Center Presents program is a week from Thursday. Uh, that event um, is entitled Votes for All Women, Women of Color in the Fight for Suffrage. And we'll have a, a panel of, of historians talking about the ways in which women of color were central to uh, the successful battle for the right to suffrage, but then of course, many of those women were left behind when that right actually uh, uh, arose. And it is of course tied to our, our special exhibit that is underway uh, at the Clinton uh, Presidential Library, uh, Women's Voices, Women's Votes, Women's Rights. And I really urge you to come out, take a look at a, a wonderful exhibit. And so thank you all for celebrating His Hispanic Heritage Month. And thank you again to Daniela and Danielle for being here tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.